see how this is going to work. This is the first time I've ever used this, and I've had to figure out how to use it by myself. You can go to Blackboard Ultra. There should be a list for Blackboard Collaborate there. And then you should be able to just click on the link and just go to the date. I'll just do the date for this. And then it'll load in in a separate tab. But you still got the Blackboard site available. Let's see if it picks, hopefully it picks up my headset. So right now, it don't look like there's anybody in the session. Not really sure. We don't know that uh, because uh, Allison's doing a class where they have to make presentations. And then um I see like I was going to make a Sancho, uh, there's a extension cord over here that you might be able to use. So this is the link down here. This is the one we're not really, really sure of what's going to happen. Uh, so here's where I can share my content. So uh, see, so William. Uh, uh, or Max, he looks like he joined from home. So you should be able to click on mic, and it should come out here and look for your mic. There it is. Uh, and also you can share your camera here, which is pretty neat. That's going to be confusing, though. <laughs> So Brianna's joined. So this is the way you might want to turn your speaker down. That part. No, I see. I might want to turn your uh, speaker down so it don't get so confusing. But this is the way we're going to use our classes. So I put instructions on there also, but we're using Blackboard Collaborate, and it's pretty straightforward on how it works. Turn off. Okay. So this is where you can raise your hand. So I'll I'll be able to know when you raise your hand, like ask a question or make a comment. And so this is the way we're going to do attendance also. So uh, we're going to have class. But all we're going to do for those that came in a little late is until we meet on, until we come back to the classroom in session, when we meet class, we're going to meet it during the regular class time. So that's already in your schedule, right? Understand that. And we're going to do it for the, for the right period. We're going to do lectures. And then what we're going to do is when we come back, we'll just be in lab. And if we don't come back, I have no idea what we're going to do. So we'll just have to figure that out because this class really needs to. And at the faculty meeting, that's brought up. I said, you know, how would you like uh, for we talked about career tech and the difference between academics because they were all online, online, we'll do it online, no problem. I said, yeah, let's, let's have your car go to a car place and break stick. We'll pick it up and watch the video. We'll have to fix the road. <laughs> so, uh, let me say, I'm fixing it, but not guaranteeing it, right? 
So what I can do is uh, we can come up here and I can share my content. Uh, really? It might be the Wi-Fi. I don't know. We got good Wi-Fi in here. We got our own repeater. And you turn you turn this you turn your speaker your microphone on right down at the bottom. You can mute yourself, by the way. I'm here. I'm picking up somebody. Yeah. So y'all can. Yeah. So this is strange. Uh, when I first started sharing video, this is the way it's going to look. So you get your laptop, and I put the instructions up there. So you can go to Bible on the left hand menu. Not uh, when you get into the course, so you go into the left hand menu. This is Bible Collaborate. Uh, then you just click on join, join, uh, join the session. And what I'll do is I will. Uh, Put the date of the lecture up there. That's the way we'll do the lecture. Okay. So like I was telling the rest of the class, we are going to have class that is going to be all all online. Uh, we'll have time toward the end of the term to come in and do do the labs. Are we okay? Are we okay? Is that cool? Everybody else okay or just you? That's okay. What do you mean the video thing works? We can see you. I don't know. I didn't use the camera yet. Okay. You can. You can mute the camera and you can also mute the, the uh, you can also mute the speaker. So if you don't want us to hear what you're saying, you need to do what? Mute, yeah, mute the microphone, yeah. To what? Okay, well, that's what we'll have to do. Y'all just come up with a procedure. Uh, uh, if you got a scanner, you can scan me your timesheet, and I'll send it back to you by email. That would be fine, too. Or I can send them an email. Just let me know the format it needs to be, and we'll just have to work it out that way. Yeah, I know they do that because if they want to pay you, they want you to make sure you're in class, even if you're not in class. <laughs> so to you, you're like you're going to like this, huh? <laughs> Yeah, you could do that. I don't know how close you get to be to get uh, the private network, and y'all get that out in the in the libraries. Libraries, just all libraries have the free. Usually, the libraries they lim they limit you on the time, but the usually the library they limit you the time you can be on the computer. Right? I'm not sure. I, it's been a long time. No, we'll be here. So we're still required to come in. And do our classes, so we're still required to come in because they're paying us for being here. So, what's that? No, everything's everything's going to be online. It's just that it's going to be solid lecture until we come back, and then we'll go. We'll, we'll be in solid lab. Hopefully, that's the way I envision it. But everything's going to be online. Everything's going to be online. So basically, you're not a yeah. Now that's gonna be bad because that's a predominantly lab class. So uh so I don't know, it's gonna be interesting guys. And like I said, this is new to us. Uh, well, we've talked about doing online lectures and then coming in for lab and do what we call hybrid classes, but we can't even do that now. Oh so, well. Uh, 
So no, y'all won't be allowed on campus, uh, as far as I know. So, like I said, I'm new to this too. And I don't see where I can actually pause this. So, uh, because you'll see the, the hand sanitizer over on the, uh, and of course, we got it beside each uh, restroom. Huh? Where did you hear that at? Don't tell me you see. Don't say on the internet. No. You know, I can't say anything on the radio. Somebody needs to move to a mic. No Tucker, James. What's that? Did Jason come in? No. Sarah didn't come in. Elaine. Elaine. Huh? Elaine. Hey, uh, everybody okay on position sensors? I mean, up to potentiometers. Everybody okay on potentiometers? I don't know. So was it just disconnecting or something? Really? A blackboard discussed, and this is going to be very interesting. I don't know. Uh, they sent out an email saying they was going to really work on this. Is uh, all the two-year colleges and everything, and also universities that's using Blackboard. They all went to what this week? Totally online classes. And they didn't know. They didn't, they wasn't really sure right now if they was going to have the bandwidth to handle all that. So I don't know. But you are connecting, and it's disconnecting you. Is that happening to everybody or just a couple of you? It might be, oh, you mean he's got a hot spot? And of course it might be the private network here. So. I got chloride. So I did spray the I did spray and wipe the the tables down by the way. Too. So everybody okay on how we uh how we uh not only test them, we know we can test them with the nonmeter, right? And what should be measure of so 10K pot, how does that work? Where do we, where should we measure 10K at? On this one, it would be A and C, yeah. 
So when we set a 10K pot, this the, it should measure 10K there. Now, if we measure between one side and then the wiper, uh, it should go all the way from zero up to 10K, right? Everybody understand that? And then the other side would measure the same way, but it would move in the opposite direction. Uh, I can't find this every semester, by the way. But which one you use is a common, uh, so normally one of the end of the pots will be, we will use it as our common, right? And then uh, if this is one, two, three, and the only difference uh, that makes uh, which one you use is the common, either one, three, either three, turn the pot to make it increase. One way, one is increasing, the other is decreasing. Well, I usually do it now, but I want to do it. I mean, one is three, not two. Three, two, two, two. But then we came up with the transfer function, right? So uh, what would be the transfer function for this? A pot is divided by 10 volts and it's set to 82 degrees, the range of a transfer pot is 90 degrees. Calculate the output, which is 80 degrees. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we calculate what? The transfer function. And then we do out, the maximum out, which would be 10. Divide by the maximum degrees, which would be 350, and this come up and gave us our transfer function of 28 point something millivolts, right? 28.7, 28.6 millivolts. Of course, the more you carry it out, the more accurate your calculations will be. We have to realize this is a pot. Most pots have a tolerance of around. So it should work, and then I would take what? My 82 degrees. Sure. Times the transfer function. And what would I give us? Yeah, 2.34 volts. Uh, now if we did this, then whatever's, whatever instrument is scaling this, uh, then we could scale this to whatever, what we wanted, 82, uh, 350 degrees to equal, right? You understand that? Makes sense. And we looked at the, these different uh, loading errors, right? So for the pot to work, we can't load it with, uh, there's no way in the world we can hook up something to the wiper of the pot and not load it, right? You understand? So there's no such thing as infinite resistance. So what we're shooting for is over here, we're shooting for something uh, that's got a watt. Now this is an op amp, by the way, which has an extremely high input impedance. Operational amplifiers are around uh, 100 meg noise. You can still call it inverting amplifiers. Uh, inverting means it's 180 degrees out. For not inverting amplifier, you can you can actually set your input to your input resistance. So we we'll have to this in some high resistance mode. So when we use our meter, our meter goes. First of all, 
is we have to measure this. We have to make, if it's a 350 degree pot, we're going to have to make sure that we get 350 degrees worth of rotation out of it. So we have a compass that we'll put down on the table and then uh, we'll set zero and then we'll see how far it actually rotates. And then that's what you'll use. You won't use the 350 degrees. You understand that? that Makes sense. And then we looked at actually taking this to the gear. So uh, going that way with multiply, going this way with divide, right? Everybody okay? Yes or no? And then we look at setting the span on the pot. So this is one thing y'all going to do. Yeah, the span is the range of voltages that we will get out, right? Okay. So uh, we're going to come up here and put a resistor right here and resistor right here. And we want to, and we're going to use, let's say we use 15 volts. And we want you know, 10 volts right here. And, we, and we're using a 10K pot. That's just because it's easy. And we want, uh, Two volts right there. So what size will our resistors be? And we'll calculate them. Uh, we'll calculate them precise. We won't use the. So my top resistor, how many volts do I want it to drop? If I want 10 volts right here, I start off with 15. I want 10 volts right there. How many volts do we want it to drop? Yeah. So my voltage drop here will be 5 volts. Okay. And then, of course, this is given. So the voltage drop down, down here would be uh, 2 volts. What would be the voltage drop across my pot? Got 10 on the top, got 2 on the bottom, 10 on the top, 2 on the bottom. What would be the voltage drop? So what do I know two things about? I don't know two things about the top of this. I know it drops 5 volts, and I don't know anything else. I know one thing. I don't know two things about the bottom resistor. It drops 2 volts, and that's all I know. Uh, the middle resistor, which is my potentiometer, I know two things about it. What do I know? What two things do I know? Okay, so we can find the current on this resistor right here, right? So I the pot would be equal. How do we solve for current? We're solving for I. <laughs> I know what you meant. So A divided by 10K, that gives you my current across through the pod. So if I know the current through the pod, uh, not, not merely. 800 Michael, yeah. So now I know two things about everything. So now I can solve for R, my top R. So we'll call this R1. So it will give us something we can use in our equation. We'll call this R2. We'll call it that one R pot. <laughs> R8. So what size resistor would I use for R1? 6.25K. Good. 6.25K. I heard that. Nobody said that. I did. Max is not here. Is that Max? Is that Max? Yeah, I'm on the online. Yeah, I saw that, Max. Everything working okay? Yeah, the microphone's a little spotty, but I can understand. Okay. 
6.25K, is everybody okay there? And then what would the bottom one be? Spring <laughs> up. I'm doing fine. What's the bottom what's the bottom what's the size of the bottom one? R two. So one thing you're going to have to do, you need to mute your microphone until you're ready to talk, right? And why is that? Yeah, we'll get feedback, yeah. What's R2? Two volts, 800 microamps, R is equal to V over I. 800 microamps, yeah, I see. What size is it? What's that? What's that? We talked a little bit about these uh these flash right? This is what we probably use inside of the sensor that gives us a digital output, even though the sensing element is uh analog. So we're gonna have a lot of these sensors where the sensing element itself is actually analog. So that means I've got to run it into a digital system. Digital is by far the most popular method of control. We saw that in both controls. So with both controls, there's only one lab that we did where we actually did the sensor. And that's when we did our industrial sensor, right? The industrial sensor is the sensor watch over there. Well, how we did that use a sensor metal, yeah. So it's a sensor metal. Well, different different metals have different characteristics as far as take the output of the element and then we'd bring it in and then over here we would come over here and we would set a threshold by using either a voltage divider or a pot and so if I set this to three volts then that means this output right here when it got up to three volts and the output would trip right you understand that and if it got below three volts it would do what we cut off and we said some sensors actually have a pot back there so you can actually do what you can actually adjust the threshold where it switches and then we talked about what your meter actually uses it uses an integrated slope which is why it's so slow so the biggest disadvantage is it's extremely accurate but it's what slow and anybody's got a digital meter on my cell, it's moving. And it, it'll, it'll range on you. So it, it, uh, auto ranging meter is written slower because it's got to run out of counts before it does what? Before it ranges on you. Now the PLC is going to have one of these guys right here. Where we're going to take an analog input and it's going to run it into a AZ converter that converts it over to a, an approximation of a binary equivalent. 
so here we're using uh, eight bits. And we call this base two. So how do we calculate the number of uh, combinations we can get, guys, with eight bits? Minus one. Why minus one? You got to take out the zero. So this will give us 255 combinations. These would be death that we would come in and we would get this. Now, lucky PLCs are computers. And like I said, I'll try to show you all this. I think I'll bring a camera in and maybe show you all this. But the uh, PLC is going to convert this to decimal for you. But you still have to know the what. You still have to know the transfer function. So over here, we're bringing in what? Uh, maximum of 5 volts. Let's take that to 10. Most PLCs run 10 volts. So here we're putting degrees in, we're getting volts out. So to calculate our transfer function would be 10 divided by how many steps? 255. So now this is out, right, and then uh, out of this. And so what would be our transfer function? I'm waiting. We wouldn't say that in this class. Not in engineering. What's that? 40 milli? Milli volts per, we call it step. So that means what would happen if I would come over here, if I put 20 milli volts in, nothing would happen. If I put 30 millivolts, nothing would happen. When I did 40.000, then this output would go to a 1, and all the rest of them would be a what? A 0. And then I got up to 40, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, all the way up to what? 80.000. Then this would go a zero and that would go to a one, which means a two, right? Everybody okay there? So what do we do? If I wanted to convert the weights, what would we do? Well, we'd come down here and we'd write down the number. Let me erase the top thing up here. And then we start off with what? Anybody know? One. What comes next? Two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight. So I would come over here and I click this guy right here. That's what we're setting at now. And that I add everything together and it would come up and give me a lot of two, right? So what would happen? If I was to bring in a, a, a waveform that looked like this, that was DC, this was 10 volts, and this was zero, then my output here would actually move, be moving in steps, right? With each count being another count. So the resolution we have would be how big is those steps? And what determines the resolution on the size of the steps? I mean, bits is converted over to digital, right? I understand that. So, uh, and then the, uh, our digital oscilloscope is and run it into a uh, digital analog converter. So on the digital scope, you can actually see what well, you can actually see the steps. So. Uh, Everybody okay here? So like I said, the 1100 here that just turned off, it has a converter in it. 
Um, so 10 bit means that guy can take an analog input and uh, it can do uh, 10 volts, which we can bring into it. 10 volts divided by 1,023. Okay, we're at 1,023. How do we do that? 10 bit. We get our calculator out, and there's a magic key on there called Y to the X. It might be X to the Y, right? Okay. Well, then you just type in 2. And then you'd enter what to the tenth. It comes up and gives you a thousand twenty-four minus one means you get a thousand twenty-three steps. <laughs> the bigger the, the the bigger the number of bits, subtracting the one would not make enough difference on the twelve bit the converter anyway, right? So, but this is the actual way we calculate it. So, this way, if you got a program. And then you would take that count and then you equal it to your function, right? Does that make sense? Or, uh, we talked about abs uh, in uh, in uh, absolute encoder. Everybody, so what's the advantage of an absolute encoder? As always on this place, you know, I would probably turn it down and know exactly where it's at. Well, well, but you don't want it to reset because it moved your spot. If you need to zero, you just move it. Well, this guy right here, I'm using four bands. Only give me 16 positions, period. And each one of those positions is going to be a certain amount of inches of feet, right? So if I wanted to, these guys are pretty fast. So it's not the feet, it's every, so let's say, what would I have to do? What would I have to do to add, what would happen if I added one more man? I'd still only get 32 positions, right? So I got a robot out there that's got hundreds of thousands of positions. I understand how many bands would I have to have if I use an absolute encoder? A lot. And now they get so dang close together, either either it's gonna be as big as this room or I'm gonna make the band shorter. Which is now my alignment is extremely critical on all my sensors. Well, the problem with this guy is that the more the better the resolution, which means accuracy by the way, the better the accuracy, the more bands I've got to have. That tighter it is, right? So I think we showed y'all this example. So these are great, but we're not going to deal with a lot of resolution because these wheels are either going to get big or they're going to get they're going to stay at the same size. Which now the bands have got to get what closer together. They're going to get narrow. Not only they're going to get closer together, they're going to get it narrow. And then our our whatever we use to pick this stuff thing up with is going to be very so this is only four bands right here, so this gives us 16 combinations, right? I showed you all the printer, didn't I? So this is counting in binary. So we came up with a code called gray code. What advantage does gray code have over this code? Which means that we can run it a lot faster, right? So gray code is a code. We can't just look at the number and calculate the way. Unless you know the little trick. If you don't, you have to look it out on a chart. Or you'd have to go on the internet. The internet's so cool and just say gray code to binary converter and it would do what? You center your gray code in and it would it would give you your binary equivalent. I didn't give you your decimal equivalent. <laughs> That's great code. And this is a conversion technique, by the way. We use what we call an exclusive OR options. Yeah. Well, y'all didn't notice in this class. And of course, this was absolutely encoder I showed y'all. So you can see out here, look how close these suckers are together. 
right? And like I said, I don't know if this is another band or not. It looks like it's out too far to be considered a band. So most often we use what we call an incremental encoder. Uh, incremental encoder. Uh, we use something to select position, but we're going to have to count these things. Of course, this is an incremental encoder, and we actually showed y'all the, uh, the incremental encoder on the side of the, of the printer, right? So I saw that it kept up with the top of the paper. Had an incremental encoder across the top, which was the linear, it was linear, uh, which basically could give us depth of addition of the print head. And then we had a, a, a rotary or a circular and an incremental encoder on the side with depth of addition of the paper. And that was pretty easy to set up the zero position on the paper because the same sensor that prints the initial print paper comes out right in the fifth minute. The only problem we have on these is that. Turn power off. What's the second thing? Are we going to power and turn back on? What does that mean? We've lost our position on it. Let's get a lot. Back it up or use a battery on the, on the counters. So, this is what your robot uses. So, I don't know if they showed you all that when you took the operation of programming, but on the side of every robot, or in the back of every robot is a, is a set of batteries that keeps those counters, right? You understand that for for us. But if you ever look at batteries on robot on robots and power and with the power off, uh, then you're going to lose your uh, you're going to lose your or, what we call the origin from where it was zero reference on the robot. Okay. I showed y'all the the old mice, right? A quadrature encoders, what's the advantage of a quadrature encoder? These are increment encoders. Quadrature increment encoders, what's the advantage of these guys? Not necessarily more accurate. They can have, uh, could have a uh, better resolution. So what we can do on uh, an incremental encoder, instead of counting one of them, we can count both rows and edges, which means automatically twice as many counts as we have blades. But the problem is, is a lot of equipment that we want to know the position of has the ability to move in two directions. An incremental, a standard incremental encoder does not, in, does not indicate the what? The direction. So one direction we might want our counters to count up. The other direction we want our counters to uh, count down. So the quadrature encoder gives us two signals, and the relationship between which one occurs first depends on the direction. So on this one, this right here, the rising edge occurs first, right? You understand? On this one, the rising edge. Oh, I'm sorry. Rising edge, rising edge. No, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the bottom. I'm going down here. But on this one, no, this is the right. So this rising edge occurs first. I was trying to increment both directions, right? On here, this rising edge occurs first. So what we can do, depending on which rising edge occurs first, would it would be a lot with the same direction that the Your encoder, but I could uh, change my animation to go backwards. 
and we'll have a, some type of decoding circuit. Uh, if we do it uh, in total, uh, if we do it electronically, then now your computer will be able to exactly support it. But you tell it which direction is you have to you have to say which direction you want to be count up and count down, right? So that's the only thing different there. Uh, this book, this book, the, uh, a lot of, when you look up a lot of things, it'll talk about the encoders uh, uh, being absolute on a robot, but they're not. They're, they appear as an absolute encoder to the controller, uh, but they actually have batteries on them, right? Uh, next one, we didn't get to this. It's called Linear Differential Transformers. LVDT. Okay, you might there. Yeah. An LVDT, what it does is uh, it, it works on a transfer. Now, what determines how much? So we know transformers uh, how they work. Everybody okay on transformers? They work off of what we call mutual induction. So what do we need? What determines? How much uh, induction we get? Yeah, first of all, this is it. The strength of the field. Because that's what these guys change right here. What else? The number of conductor loops. What else? The speed of the motion between of uh, the magnetic field, right? So what we do with the PTT is we do transformers. We have a primary. So this is where we'll put our AC in. And then we have a secondary, we have two secondaries that are wound opposite. Now the direction that we wind the secondary determines the phase. So is it in phase with input or out of phase with input? Most of the time on regular transformers, we don't care what the phase they are. So if you ever look at a rep, Regular transformer usually they're wound in the same direction. So I mean, the magnet that comes out of your primary is going to go into your secondary, which causes the voltage to be the, the, the voltage on the, the secondary to be 180 degrees by the voltage on the primary. That's a standard transformer. A standard transformer, you don't change the strength of the magnetic field. The magnetic field is determined by that big laminated core that you have. Right. So what we're going to do with an LVDT is we change the strength of the magnetic field by shifting the core. So the core actually shifts. So the more of the core we put into the trans into the secondary, the more motion we get out. The less of the uh, core we put out of it, the less we get out. And these guys are wired 180 degrees out of phase, which means they subtract from each other. So what that means in this position right here, uh, this guy is putting out an output like this. This guy is putting an output like that. They're exactly opposite of each other. So this would mean if I had two batteries and I come up here and wired them like this, and both of them were exactly 1.5 volts, 1.5 volts, and I measured this in my meter, what would I measure? I'd measure zero volts. So what this means, when the LVDT is in the center, this guy puts out zero volts because the two watt, the two windings cancel each other out. Now what we're doing is we're going to come down here, 10 volts would probably be best, Well, let's use 10 volts. 
So let's say we start shifting it right here, and this goes up to 12, and this over here would go down to what? 8. And what would I have? I'd have two votes out right now. Well, what if, but I'm not changing my reference. So let's say this is black and this is red. Uh, let's say this right here goes to 12 and this right here goes to 8. Now I'd have what? Minus 2. Everybody understand that? So what we're doing with the LVDT is we're changing the core. So the more core we have in the winding, the more votes you said secondary will put out. The less, well, the less core we have in the winding, the less we put out. Make sense? So what we can do here is we can sum them together. So let's say I move it in this way. Then this guy here is going to move this way. This guy is going to go up. This guy over here is going to do what? Go down. So now what that means is, if I can see it, here's the net. This guy is bigger, so that means what? The output would be in this phase right here. Everybody okay with this? Now if we go the other way, here they're equal. So this is where we started off here. If this one's bigger and this is smaller, then we'll have a bigger output, uh, but the phase will be opposite. So what can we tell this? So if B1 is greater, we know it's, we know it's moving in that direction, right? If I vote, we get out. How much? Right. If it moves this way, then what? Then B2 would start being greater. And we, so we know the direction, right? So the amplitude gives us the position and the what? And phase gives us the, starts with a D, gives us the direction. Now, what's nice about these is we, they look like chocolate so far. You know, they're sealed up at real time with real time. But it's going to take some pretty sophisticated electronics to figure out what the amplitude and the watt and the direction. And their limited stroke, too. The stroke is how far we can move that. So another problem with these guys is what? Their limited stroke. How far can we move? Like that. Maybe the position of how we can move. Okay. LVDTs. So how many y'all got out there? A lot. <laughs> so do you run it directly to a PLC or do you run it in some type of a, a module that actually handles these guys? Y'all hear me? It has a module that's specifically designed for the LVDTs. So this is an example of an LVDT, which is a picture that I found on the internet. And here's some other examples of LVDTs that I pulled off the internet. Are we okay? And this is a circuit that would take an LVDT and give us a voltage and a direction. A resolver, a type of rotary transformer used to measure position, so it works on the same principle as the LVDT. Uh, these were one of the first ones uh, in a, we call them synchro, and this is what we used to do before they came out with the uh, with the digital encoders. Uh, this is what we did on our plane to send all the position of all the flights on the control surfaces right around. Rather in your elevators and your trench tabs. And this is taken to our autopilot up here. So this basically has uh, two windings, basically the same. And then what we want to get the position of, uh, we hook that up to the watt action rotation. And then what it does, it gives us a watt. It gives us a voltage and a polarity that not only tells us. It also tells us the direction. These are called resolvers. Or 
on the same principle as the watt. If you understand an LVDT, you can understand what this guy. Except this guy, the LVDTs are linear. This guy right here is watt. This row. Right okay. okay. Okay, guys, let's break. Ten minutes. Huh? So you ever get yours working okay on on Sancho's hot butt? Okay. <laughs>